I've been singing about my war for so many years. I have sung when I've been happy, and I've sung when I've had tears. Some folks may even question if it's all been just a show. But the reason that I'm singing I want the world to know That I sing because There is an empty grave I sing because There is the power to save And I sing because His grace is real to me I sing because I know I'm not alone, I sing because Someday I'm going home where I shall sing Through all eternity Well I've sung to those walking Through the fiery trials And I've watched their saddened faces turn into happy smiles. I bowed my head and whispered, Oh Lord, please do the same for me. And I'm glad that I can tell that He brought me victory. Well, I sing because. There is an empty grave, I sing because There is the power to save And I sing because His grace is real to me I sing because I know I'm not alone I sing because Someday I'm going home where I shall sing through all eternity I sing because I know I'm not alone I sing because Someday I'm going home Where I shall sing Through all eternity Um, I was here for a couple of months uh, before we moved there, but before um, I moved, uh, my wife and my three daughters, actually, we lived here for uh, almost eight years, and uh, I've been an assistant pastor, I've been a music director, uh, um, I've, you know, worked in churches, and uh, so it's just, a, it's a, always a blessing to be able to get behind a pulpit, and it's always a blessing uh, that a pastor gives me the opportunity to preach. Uh, I don't take it lightly. I do want to say this, that uh, I really do appreciate Pastor Bob and Miss Ruth uh, especially because uh, from the moment that my wife and I stepped foot uh, in, uh, through these doors and started attending Emmanuel, uh, we've just felt nothing but love. Uh, we've felt nothing but uh, appreciation and, and care from them. And uh, it makes me sad, you know, we lived here for eight years and uh, Anthony and Brianne you know, attended here for so long. How long did they attend here, Antoinette? Um, yeah, five or six years. But they attended here just, uh, you know, uh, they always spoke about you guys, and they always mentioned Ruth and uh, how she was so good with the kids. And my kids, especially my second one, Juliet, she's four now. She just turned four. She absolutely loves Ruth. And uh, maybe it's just the candy and gift she gives her, but uh, I tell you what, Miss Ruth won over my daughter's heart. And uh, if you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Kings. Uh, this morning we're going to be in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to read just one verse, but I'd like you to read it with me. And then I'll say a couple words. I'll give the title of my message and then uh, we'll get to it. 1 Kings 18, verse 30 is where we're going to begin. It's 
good to see you here, Savannah. She was in our youth group when my wife and I were here. 1 Kings 30, it says, uh, why don't you go ahead and read with me. Ready, begin. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken. He repaired the altar. This is a spectacular event in history. And the power of God is revealed, and people believe because of it. We live in a day and age where God's power and love is present with us, yet many people have broken down the altar of Christianity uh, that has stood. And as, we see, as we'll see this morning with a brief history a lesson and a short application, God is simply just trying to bring the people back to him. And I don't know, I don't know many of you this morning, I know a few, and I don't know where you're, but I don't know where your Christian life stands this morning. Uh, but if we are following the ways of this world uh, and the pattern that they have set, we will end up where Israel ended up, following the wrong people to the wrong God. We must do what Elijah did. We must repair the altar, and we must show the power of God to the people around us. So let's pray, and then we'll get into the message. Heavenly Father, we love you, and Lord, I just want to thank you so much, Lord, uh, for your blessings on our lives. And Lord, I want to thank you for just the power that you bring, uh, bring us, Lord, on a daily basis, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, that you look at us and think we are worth it. And uh, Lord, I just ask that you would help us, Lord, today uh, to just get something from the message, Lord, that we could take and, and help us grow in our Christian life. And I ask that you would bless now. We ask you these things in your name. Amen. So just an overall look at the book of Kings. I'm just going to kind of, normally when I uh, preach a message, I tend to outline the book that I'm preaching in uh, so that I can kind of learn the history of what's going on there. So I'm going to kind of reiterate that to you, uh, whether you and I know it or not. So the first thing that we see in the book of 1 Kings is we see the death of David. Uh, there's a lot of stigma that surrounds David's death. Excuse me. Uh, you can laugh at me. If I, if I say something funny, laugh. It makes me feel better, okay? So let's practice that. There we go. Thank you. So uh, if my voice cracks, just laugh. It's okay. It's been doing it my whole life. Uh, to me, it's evident uh, that David wanted to choose Absalom as his successor, but that didn't really happen. Uh, and it really ends in a glorious fashion. David becomes senile, and then Adonijah tries to insert himself as the role of, in the role of king. Then David anoints Solomon, and there is a lot of drama uh, that goes on with that. And then we finally see Solomon as king. So first of all, we see the death of David, but then we see uh, Solomon's reign. Solomon is anointed king, and he's charged by David in his uh, last moments to be a man. How would you like that? I don't know if any of you, you know, you've, uh, I know eventually, uh, you know, I'll have to watch my parents go on to see the Lord, but I really hope on my, my dad's uh, deathbed that he doesn't look at me in the face and say, Charlie, be a man, Right? That's just, uh, you know, it makes me wonder if David had much faith in, or in Solomon being a good king. Either way, God's man was chosen, and Solomon does something wise. So we see de David's death, Solomon's reign, and now we look at Solomon's fame. Solomon was married to the daughter of Pharaoh, and we see the spirit of compromise in this marriage. Uh, but he wants to do well during uh, during his, uh, Solomon was the prince of peace while David was a man of war. Uh, and you see prosperity and peace reign in the kingdom un under Solomon's reign. Solomon then prays for wisdom and God gives it to him. He builds a temple and the fame of Sp Solomon is spread throughout the world. Now that's a very paraphrased history of that portion. But then we see Solomon's shame. We see the high places uh, in the book of Kings were still an issue when Solomon became king because their, uh, their, the house of the Lord hadn't been built. The temple had not been built. But Solomon loved the Lord, and uh, Solomon ends up building the temple, uh, and he walks in the statues of David, statutes of David, but then he sacrifices to false gods. And in my opinion, that's not really wise for the wisest man that ever lived, 
And uh, it's a perfect place right there to draw the fact, though, that uh, you and I can have wisdom, but we can still act foolishly when, with the wisdom that God has given to us. Psalm is, Solomon is quite possibly one of the most colossal failures in Scripture. And uh, I think of the verse, For whom uh, soever much is given, much shall be required. And uh, what was first a spot now becomes this glaring failure. He has a thousand wives and many concubines. And uh, I think, uh, isn't he the one who, who said in Proverbs, it's better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a white house with a brawling woman? I mean, try having 2,000 women in your house. And uh, that was funny. Here we go. Yeah. Cool. So God says he's going to divide the kingdom, but he tells Solomon he's not going to do it in his day. And uh, Solomon concludes his 40-year reign, and he dies. Then we see the division of the kingdom. Rehoboam is the person who uh, takes over for Solomon, and he's unwise in his early rule. And we, if we recall, uh, his advisors told him, or Solomon's advisors told him, they said, you know, uh, what you should do is you should, uh, you should lighten the, the, the load on the people and they'll, you'll be in their favor because of that. So he goes, Rehoboam goes to the younger men and he asks for their advice as well. And they say, no, you don't need to lower, uh, you know, lower your uh, intensity on them. You need to build it up. You need to make it stronger. Make your yoke heavier. And so he does. And it splits the kingdom and Jeroboam leads ten, uh, leads ten of the north, ten of the north uh, uh, families into or tribes into idolatry, and Rehoboam takes his two. And God tries to give Rehoboam a chance to repent. He tries, and then he just plunges into total apostasy. And it's really not a lot of good news happening right here. So, moving down, uh, and not trying to bog down in some kingly drama, uh, we see Ahab, the son of Omri, takes over in the north kingdom a little down the line and is uh, worse. Ahab is just worse than Omri. We all know, we've heard of Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And really, if you know, you know. I mean, Omri wasn't a great king, but Ahab wasn't better at all. And he goes even farther, and he marries the hated Jezebel. Now, I, I always ask this when I mention Jezebel behind a pulpit. How many of you know, is there anybody in here that knows somebody named Jezebel? One? It's always just one. And uh, you don't see too many people named Jezebel, do you? No. And uh, hopefully they're a wonderful person. Um, so, but this Jezebel was not. And he goes farther, and he marries that hated Jezebel. And just to give some background... Jezebel was the daughter of Eth Baal, and he was the king of the Zidonians, and he was the high priest of Baal. So, he was a pagan. That's what you need to know. Then, we get to, we're starting to get to the exciting part of kings, in my opinion, and that's when Elijah enters. And I really like Elijah. He's one of my favorite Bible characters. I think he's, uh, in my mind, he's like the Peter of the Old Testament. And, I mean, this guy had some guts. He walks into Ahab's court, and he says, listen, dude, that's the Charlie version, by the way, not, uh, not the Bible version. Uh, listen, dude, you're wicked. God doesn't like it, and now there's going to be a, a drought for three years. Boom, mic drop, and he walks out. This, this is where, we, uh, this is where uh, he comes then, and God provides for him, and he sends him to Cherith, and he feeds uh, and provides for Elijah by the brook of Cherith, and he feeds him with ravens. So ravens every day bring him food, and he drinks water at the brook Cherith. And then once that drought gets uh, heavy enough to where the brook dries up, he then sends him somewhere else. He sends him to Zarephath. Now Zarephath is, uh, Je that was, if you remember, Jezebel's father was the king of, uh, or was the king of the Zidodians here at Zarephath, and so he's like in the, it's like a terrorist country, basically, you can imagine, but God providentially provides for him with a widow woman and her widow son. He gets there, and 
She's out gathering, uh, trying to gather some sticks so she can cook uh, a little meal uh, in, a, in, a, in a cruise. And she's, she's like, I only got just this little bit left. And my son and I are going to eat it, and then we're going to die. And Elijah's like, well, feed me first. And she's like, okay. She trusts the man of God, and she feeds him, and God provides for them. For the rest of the drought, he sits here with this little woman, and, he provide, and God provides for them. And that little, that little oil in that cruise never fades away, and that little meal in that barrel never fades away. And it's just odd. But God uses those circumstances uh, to provide and show his power to Elijah during, during this drought that lasts for three years. But now we come to chapter 18. So we've just worked our way through all of uh, uh, 1 Kings. Now we're up to chapter 18 where Elijah does something else that's pretty cool in my opinion. And we have Elijah on Mount Carmel, and that's not caramel for those of you who like to say it that way. Now Elijah comes back to Ahab after three years of drought, and this is where our message begins. So I'm going to kind of break down chapter 18 a little bit further than what I broke down the rest of the book. So verses 1 through 16, we see Elijah's call. God tells Elijah to go meet with Ahab, and during this time, Ahab and the governor of his house, Obadiah, are really just trying to make sure their animals don't die. They come together, they're like, we just, let's see if we can go find some food for these animals so they don't die. You go this way, I go, I'll go this way. Obadiah goes his direction, and guess who he runs, to, uh, runs into on the way? Can anybody guess? Elijah. That was good. Thank you. So he, we, he runs into Elijah, and while on the way, he runs into Elijah, who's been gone for three years, and Elijah tells Obadiah, he says, hey, I want you to go tell Ahab that I want to talk to him. And Obadiah's like, oh no, I'm not going to tell him, and then you go hide again, because once that happens, God, Ahab's going to kill me, and I don't want to die. I want to live. I've survived this drought so far. I think I can make it a little bit farther. And Elijah assures him, he says, I'm not going to, that's not going to happen again. Uh, And so Obadiah goes and he tells Ahab, hey, guess who's back in town? Your friendly neighborhood Elijah, exactly. And so then Elijah and Ahab meet and Ahab is like, aren't you the one who got us into this mess in the first place? And uh, Elijah smartly answers, he says, no, you're the one that got yourself into this mess. I'm just the messenger. And by the way, I've been in this mess with you these last three years. Uh, You followed false gods and you've led Israel astray and you, Mr. Ahab, bear responsibility. That's heavy news. And then you see Elijah's challenge, verse 17 through 24 of chapter 18. So then Elijah, I hope you're picturing this. So then Elijah challenges 450 prophets of Baal to a contest of wits on the top of Mount Carmel. Now, if you've seen Princess Bride, this will make sense to you. Don't mess with the prophet of the Lord when death is on the line, right? About two of you, thank you. You need to go watch that one. Basically, the prophets that can, uh, basically, the, uh, the challenge is this. The prophets that can bring down fire from their God is the winner, right? Easy. Easy enough. I mean, you and I do that all the time, right? So we see Elijah's challenge, and then we see evil's reply. Verse 25 and 26, the prophets of Baal use every type of incantation they can think of to bring this fire down on the altar. And then we see evil's attempt in verse 27 through 29. They cut themselves, they jump on the altar, they cry aloud, but to no success, their attempt is in vain. And then we see Elijah's success in verse 30 through 41. Elijah calls, first he calls the people to him, and he repairs the altar in front of them. Even though the kingdom is still split, he takes 12 stones, and he builds an altar in the name of the Lord and of Israel. He then makes a trench around the altar, puts wood on the altar, and cuts the sacrifices into pieces and lays it on the wood. 
And then he dumps four barrels of water on the altar three times, and he soaks the sacrifice and the wood. Now, I used to, uh, I used to run a, a, a club, it was called Master Clubs for little kids here in town, and we would go up to, uh, we'd go up to the Mesa, not the Mesa, up in um, like Mud Springs area, and we'd go camping with them every year for two days. That was a blast, taking 40 kids camping. Man, you've never experienced something so wonderful and stinky. Uh, but we went, but we would go, and what I would do is I would try to show them some things. We'd show them how to, how to, how to build a tent. We'd show them how to build a fire. And one thing that I would do with them is I'd show them how they can uh, put a pack together when they go hiking just in case they get lost and how they could start a fire without matches. And so I'd do like, uh, but have you ever tried to do that in the rain? No. Uh, I, I, lived in Was- I live in Washington State now, and unlike Colorado, I think it rains about 65 days out of the year here. But in Washington, it rains about 170 days out of the year. Uh, so it's always wet. But that's where I grew up camping. And you bring waterproof matches when you go hiking in Washington. You don't bring flint and steel. It's just uh, because you never know what you're going to run into. But Elijah basically does that. He, just, he sets up this altar. He sets up the wood. He dumps a ton of water on it. And he goes, all right, guys. We're going to light this thing on fire. And he makes it very clear in his prayer whom he serves. And then he requests that the God of the universe show the people who he, God, is. Then God sends fire down. He takes the sacrifice. He takes the water. And the Bible even says he takes the dust. Think about it. You guys ever watch uh, like uh, Coyote, Widely Coyote and Road, Roadrunner, right, growing up? And uh, how, you know, uh, they'll run and then you have the dust that's just left behind them, right? God doesn't even leave the dust when he comes. He, take it, he took it right with them. And uh, the people fall on their faces, uh, on their faces before God, and the people proclaim him as the one true God. And then, this is a cool one, you guys listening here? He kills the 450 prophets. He just chops their heads off or something. I don't know what he does, but he takes them and he kills them all. That's, I mean, that's gory right there. I mean, you talk about, uh, you know, you're talking about the gory movie that you watched before you came to church last night. Uh, this is worse than that. And uh, he does that. And that's kind of where our message lives this morning. What can we learn from this? Like I said in the beginning, we, we live in a day and age where the altar of God has been changed and reused, uh, not to the glory of God, but to the glory of another. And really, our world is obsessed with the idea that truth is relative and that we are the ones who decide what right and wrong is. But unfortunately for them, truth is not relative. Uh, Truth is found in God's Word. It's found in the foundation of Scripture. And in many ways, this is exactly where Israel was at in their day. They They chose to do what was right in their own eyes, and it led them away from the one true God to another God. So Elijah comes along, and he repairs the altar, and he shows the people, hey, God's still here. And he shows the people that God is still on the throne, and he does it in spectacular fashion. So how was the altar repaired? I want to say, number one, the altar was repaired in in front of the people. Notice verse 30. Look with me. Uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 30. It says, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Listen, there, there is a private place that you need to get between you and the Lord. But beside that, my friend, the gospel should not be hid. Let's look, uh, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and then verse 3. Uh, we're going to read just three verses. 2 Corinthians 4. It says this, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are, what? Lost. It is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, 
<clears throat> should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of, the dar- out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Listen, there is a morality that comes with the gospel. There are defining features that come with a person that is saved and separated. God commanded that the light shine out of darkness. God commanded that we walk in His light. God commanded that His light should shine in our hearts. Why would we hide that gospel? Why would we hide what God has given to us as His children? The only reason that I can think of is that our altar was made with different hands. Our altar was not made in the presence of God, but our altar was made in the presence of another. Listen, we, we may be troubled on every side, but we're not distressed. We, we're perplexed, but we are not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Listen, we have God on our side, and we have the Bible as our sword, and we need to have the presence of God in our lives, and people need to see that. Elijah repaired the altar, but he repaired the altar in front of the people. Why? Well, the They needed to see that it was real to someone. The only reason I'm standing in front of you today is because the gospel was real to some people in my life. You know, for me, it was my dad. My dad, uh, when my parents got divorced when I was seven, and my dad started going to going to a Baptist church. He got saved, and he started growing in the Lord. And uh, I lived with my mom, and, and I did not do the right things. Uh, I, I lived the way that I wanted to live, and my mom let me. And, uh, but every other weekend, I would go over to my dad's house, and I would visit with him. And uh, we'd go to church. He would take us out. To, he would take us to church Sunday morning. Uh, he would take us out on the bus route on Saturday. They had a bus route at the church I grew up in. Uh, that's the church that I'm at now. And uh, he would... Uh, he would take us out, and he just showed us and it, with his life that God was real to him. He never forced it on us. He never told us that we had to be, I, he never told me I had to be a preacher. He never told me I had to go to Bible college. My dad just said, hey, listen, you got to follow God's word. you got to live uh, the Bible. And that's what I started doing. I, I became a senior in high school, and I decided, listen, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do the military. I'm going to go into God's military. And I, and I went to Bible college, and I decided to, to be a preacher. Well, why? Because somebody made it real to me. Listen, uh, not only my parents made it real to me, but my pastor made it real to me. You know, I'm thankful for somebody who stood behind a pulpit week in and week out and just preached the truth faithfully. And he showed me a good example of what a Christian should be. Uh, like I said, he never forced it upon me. He never told me. Uh, <clears throat> he never came up to me and said, Charlie, you need to do this, you need to do that. He just got behind the pulpit and he preached the Bible. And uh, that's exactly what, uh, what this pastor does right here. And he's an example of that to us. Well, our children need to see us, friends, our children need to see us repair the altar. Our coworkers need to see us repair the altar. Our church members need to see us repair the altar. Listen, Elijah wasn't trying to hide the power of God. He was trying to get people to come close. He's like, listen, come, gather around, see what the Lord is about to do. And he repairs the altar in front of the people. He says, come and see, get over here, let's witness the power of God. But not only did he repair the altar in front of the people, he repaired the altar as a united united people. Look at verse 31 and 32 of uh, 1 Kings. Uh, we just turn back there. 1 Kings chapter 18. In verse 31, it says, And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. He's reminding them of their past. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. Israel, as we learned, was uh, broken. It was divided. 
uh, never to be physically reunited again. But God saw fit to take that which was broken and bring it back together in a spectacular event. Let me ask you, is Christ divided? Are we baptized in the name of Paul or was Paul crucified for us? No. Christ calls us to be a united church, a called out assembly uh, that is sanctified unto him. I think one of the best things about this event is that the fact, in the end, the people declared that God was the one true God. They're living, these people, they're living in a time of pluralism and polytheism, and uh, they're serving other gods and idols. And that's all wiped away because one man decided to take a stand and repair the altar of the Lord. 450 prophets could not conjure the power of this world, and one man brings together the power of God. My friend, that's the power of the gospel that God has given to us. This is what happens when you and I repair the altar. This is what happens when we preach Christ. This is what happens when we put the Lord in His rightful place in our lives. People come together and they give glory to God. Listen, I'm not, I'm not counting on the government to glorify God. I'm not counting on this world uh, to glorify God. But I'm going to glorify God, and when I do, people will come to Him. Listen, you just lift up, lift up Jesus, and people will come. And you don't need to force anything on anybody. Just lift up the name of Jesus. Last time I checked, God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. I can't imagine what people were thinking when Elijah got there and he started pouring water on the altar. They're just thinking, uh, what's this guy doing? I thought we were doing a fire thing here, not a water thing here, right? I do know this, though, that when the fire came down, the Lord was lifted up. And that, my friend, is the power of God. Listen, stop trying to make something new. Just go back to the Bible. Line upon line, precept upon precept, God's word will always stand true. He said he would preserve it. Uh, he, and we are to teach it, and that's what we are to do. Elijah repaired the altar in front of the people as a united people, and finally he repaired the altar in the name of God. Look at verse 32. We already read it. <coughs> and the... <coughs> And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> excuse me. 1 Corinthians one thirty one says this, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2.5 says this, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So what does it mean <clears throat> to repair the altar? It means putting God in his rightful place. Israel had spent way too much time and uh, too long having God in the wrong place, and, and it was time. It was time to put him back. Too often Christians like you and I, we get caught up in, in serving, and somehow we, we equate that with our spirituality and Everywhere Elijah went, he was doing the Lord's work, but we also see something else. We see that everywhere that Elijah went, God took care of him. Israel always seemed to be going astray. And when that happened, they went astray and they didn't serve God, they served other gods. And I think that we can often find ourselves in, in this place uh, where we're serving, but we just we find ourselves serving aimlessly. And... <clears throat> Much like Israel, in, mi in many ways, Israel is the pattern for the modern church. We've made ourselves busy serving God, but we've made it more about the action of serving rather than the love that should precede it. Listen, I could, I could say I love God all day long, but it's got to mean something to me. Listen, I can, I can serve and I can, I can act like I love God all day long, but it's got to mean something to me. I'm, I'm not so worried about what people think about me. I'm a little bit more worried about what God thinks about me. And I just want to love God. And I want to lift up his name 
for the people around me. And I know this, that whenever I lift up his name, people will gather. And they like to see that God's name be lifted up. Look at our marriages. Men, go, men and women go to work every day and provide for their families and come home to broken homes. Why? Well, they made it about the work and not about the love. Listen, work is important. I'm not telling you to quit the ministry. I'm not telling you to quit going to work. I mean, you quit going to work, you're probably not going to be able to provide for the family you love. But when did we start putting other things in front of God? We do the same thing with our spouses as well. You know, I'd rather have a small house and empty pockets with a wife and kids who feel my love than all the riches of this world. And the same should go with our walk for God, with God. Listen, I'm, I'm just telling you, commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts shall be established. There are too many Christians not doing anything. I'm, talking, I'm just talking about this. I'm talking about making God your first love. Make God your love. What was the last time you sang a hymn and thought about the words and it lifted your heart to the Creator? Sometimes we just come and we just sing and we just read words. We don't think about what those words mean to our Savior. When was the last time that you opened up the Word and, and you got something from it and, and God spoke to you specifically? When was the last time you wept over a truth that God gave to you? When was the last time that the pastor preached and your heart was stirred? When was the last time you gave the name of Christ to somebody unashamed? Why do we treat God like a byword? Hopefully we, we don't do that with our spouse. Hey, who's that? Oh, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's my wife. But don't tell anybody. I don't want them, anybody to know we're married. Do we do that with our spouses? I sure hope not, man. Please, don't do that. That's not good. That's not good. Why do we do that with God? <laughs> and uh, hopefully, if you do that, you're in the doghouse. I'm just telling you that right now. Listen, the Bible says we're to preach Christ. To, to preach means to herald. It means to proclaim. And I am a Christian. I love God. And I want everybody to know it. Try going to the mall and doing that with your spouse next to you. Walk there with her hand, hold it nice and tight, and go, I love my wife. You might get a round of applause because there aren't too many people doing that for uh, their wives nowadays. But I tell you what, there aren't too many people doing that uh, for the Lord nowadays either. Listen, I uh, don't hide Christ in your life. Uh, don't hide uh, the Word working in your heart. Listen, when the only thing that you and I could talk about is football and politics, there's, there's something wrong. Listen, I love football. I'm an LSU fan. Any LSU fans in here? Nobody? Oh, man. I tell you what, Tony and I are LSU fans. I mean, Anthony, you know, you know him as Anthony. Him and I are LSU fans, and they're not doing so great this year. But uh, I tell you what, I, I do love a good football game. And I'll tell you what, I do enjoy talking about politics. I mean, I could sit there and talk about politics, and I can get mad with the rest of them because that's all it does nowadays, right? But, uh, but you know what I love talking about more? I love talking about the Lord. And uh, I'm not lifting myself up, but I'm just saying uh, we, ought to be, we ought to be able to talk about Christ. We ought to be able to bring him up and, and uh, talk about him with other people. Listen, we need to repair the altar. We need to repair the altar in front of people as a united church and in the name of God. I don't know, like I said, I don't know what any of your Christian lives are like in this room today uh, and, you know, I haven't been at this church too long. I mean, I was here two months, and now I just visit when I come to town. Uh, but listen, repairing the altar is a necessity. Each of us have areas that we need to fix in our Christian lives. And we have to understand that before the fire fell, the altar had to be repaired. Do you want to have the power of God on your life? People need to see the power of God on our lives. So ask yourself these questions. Who has built my altar? Maybe it, just, maybe it doesn't need to be torn down. Maybe it just needs to be rebuilt. Because once you rebuild the altar, I think that's when you're going to see the power of God.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you, and Lord, I don't know what the needs are in this room today, uh, but Lord, I know the greatest need that we have in this world is to have you as our Savior. And Lord, I do ask that if there's somebody in this room today, Lord, that doesn't know you as their Savior, that has never trusted you and uh, made you the Lord of their life, Lord, I ask that they would come forward today during the invitation, Lord, and they would do that. But Lord, then there are those of us, Lord, who've known you for a long time now. And Lord, maybe there are some things in our life that need to be fixed and repaired. And God, I ask that you would help us, Lord, uh, to repair our altar and help us to turn our face to you. And Lord, help us to live our lives for you and give our lives to you. Lord, we love you. I ask that you would bless the invitation now. I ask you these things in your name. Amen. I sing because I know I'm not alone. I sing because someday I'm going home where I shall sing through all eternity.